All right, welcome everybody to the PNCWA Continuing Education Series. We're sitting at one o'clock here. We'll just kind of hang tight for another minute or so uh, and wait for folks to trickle in. And then I have some uh, announcements to make and then we'll hand the presentation over to today's presenter. Thanks for being here. All right, so it's 101. I think we'll get started here. So before we jump in, a couple of housekeeping reminders. Um, in order to earn the continuing education unit today, you must be in attendance for the full hour. Um, we have monitors that are watching the attendance at the beginning and the end of the presentation to ensure that you are there and engaged. So um, please stay the full hour if you would like to receive the CEU. Uh, the speaker today is open to questions. If you have questions mid-presentation, uh, please post them in the Q&A box. If you kind of uh, hover your mouse over the bottom of the Zoom bar, you'll see a Q&A um, chat box. Please post questions there. I will be monitoring that through the presentation. There will also be time at the end of the presentation to post questions, um, which I'll also be monitoring. So if you'd like to save the question to the end, that's also OK. Um, uh, PNCWA will follow up uh, after this presentation with CEU information. It may be in the next few days, so um, please hang tight, but eventually we will follow up with um, the CEU documentation. So with that, I will uh, introduce today's presenter. So today we have a presentation from Paula Dorn, who is a process engineer with Aqua Aerobic Systems, supporting the Aqua Nareda Aerobic Granular Sludge Technology. Paula graduated from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign with a BS and MS degree in civil and environmental engineering. And Paula has been in the water and wastewater industry for the past three years. So with that, I'll hand the presentation over to Paula. Thanks, Casey. Let me get everything set up here real quick. Hopefully everyone is able to view my um, presentation there. Good, it's got the okay. So, Thank you everyone for joining. Um, appreciate everyone jumping on to learn a bit more about the uh, Aqua Narita aerobic granular sludge technology. So what we're gonna do really is just provide a, hopefully a pretty comprehensive overview of Aqua Narita and aerobic granular sludge. So it'll be really kind of an introduction to the history of the technology, as well as a focus on what aerobic granular sludge actually is. So what are the attributes of it? And then as well as the granulation. The granulation implying how are these granules formed. Then we'll jump into um, an understanding of how this process scales up to provide uh, full-scale treatment in its everyday operation. And then we'll focus and highlight the startup and first year of operation of the Wolf Creek wastewater treatment plant that features the Aqua Narita technology. And then just because we have a lot of time here, a full hour, um, I'm gonna do a little bit of a um, sort of advanced section here on Aqua Narita for enhanced treatment. So for reuse applications, or when we're looking at um, uh, really nutrient uh, removal, stringent nutrient removal objectives. And then I have a few case studies to share on that. And then as mentioned, you know, we'll have a summary and then wrap up with a Q and A uh, section. And I'll also include my email on the last slide in case anybody uh, does wanna reach out to me. So starting off with just an overview of the Aqua Narita history and the installations that we have out there. It starts off over, over 25 years ago at Delft University in the Netherlands with Professor Mark Van Loostrecht, who you see pictured um, in the, on the slide all the way to the left. And they were able to successfully develop these granules in a laboratory setting back in the 90s. And then after they partnered with Royal Hasconing DHV, a large engineering firm based out of uh, the Netherlands as well, they began to transition this to full-scale installations. The first was actually an industrial application in the Netherlands back in 2005, so over 15 years ago. So this is certainly a well-established technology. And then the first municipal application uh, was actually in South Africa um, and has been running for about a dozen years now. 
Back in 2017, we actually brought this um, technology over to um, the United States and Canada. Um, my company, Aqua Aerobic Systems, signed on as the licensee for North America. And that same year, we executed the first pilot in the, uh, on the continent. Mm -hmm. The following year, in 2018, we actually uh, heavily invested in the construction of our own demonstration facility uh, here in Rockford, Illinois. Um, and I'll, I'll actually introduce you guys to that a little bit later on in the presentation as one of the case studies. Um, of January of last year, we started up the, what would officially be the first um, commercial uh, Aqua Narita installation in the United States. And this year we are actually looking at five uh, startups. Um, we're actually uh, heavily involved in three right now. So really excited about the, the rate of adoption that we've seen um, over in North America. As I mentioned, this is a, a very well-established technology on an international scale. There are over 40 plants that are in operation. I believe the exact number is 46. And there are more than another 40 that are under the design phase or under construction right now, uh, culminating in nearly 90 plants worldwide. And this year specifically, we'll be starting up 17 plants, as I mentioned, five of those in the United States. So we're seeing um, really um, rapid um, really an exponential increase in the, the adoption of this, even internationally still. So the Narita technology, um, they, it is actually, it's a batch-based process, which I'll go into more detail on later. But I mentioned that because we're able to use really a modular approach in um, addressing a range of design flows. The smallest installation uh, that's out there is about 50,000 gallons per day. I believe that's an industrial site. Uh, smealed foods in the Netherlands as well. And the largest facility in operation right now is the Ringsend plant outside of Dublin, Ireland. It uh, takes on an average flow of 160 MGD with a max of about 315 MGD. So a very large plant that actually treats, I believe, about 40% of the entire country's uh, wastewater flow. So not just a large plant, but also very integral to the infrastructure in that, uh, in that country. So here in the United States, where we've branded this as Aqua Narita, we have eight facilities that are either operating or, as I mentioned, currently in the startup phase or under construction or nearing the final design to move into the construction phase. We have the um, demonstration facility, as I mentioned, here in Rockford, Illinois. And then, of course, the Wolf Creek plant that is located in Foley, Alabama, which I'll highlight later. Starting up this year, we're actually actively working on the Norman, Oklahoma. This is a actually demonstration reuse facility for direct potable reuse applications. And then Idaho Springs in Colorado is actually um, right in the middle of the Rockies with very little room for expansion. So that was a retrofit application um, that was really only um, able to look at an ARETA or an MBR due to the foot, uh, footprint limitations that they're facing. And then also starting up this year is a uh, plant in Whitefish, Montana, Wolcott, Kansas, and then the Maui uh, Airport, uh, the Kahului Airport on the island of Maui. Um, and I know my uh, team is fighting over who gets to go out to the startup on that one. Um, and then next year, we're looking forward to moving into Nebraska and starting up a plant in South Sioux City. They take on a very a large industrial load, about 80 to 90 percent. They were looking for a very robust process to, to handle that. So now we're going to switch gears here and we'll jump into the technical side of this, really focusing on what aerobic granular sludge actually is. So we really want to give just a basic understanding really of, of course, the, um, the science behind this and then what are the advantages and differences compared to conventional activated sludge. So it is certainly an improvement over CAS. It's essentially the same type of biology and concepts for treating wastewater, but it's configured into a compact granular shape that provides better settling properties. But we really focus on three main attributes when we talk about true AGS. So what we consider to be true AGS would have a minimum particle diameter of 200 microns or greater. And I'll uh, explain why that's the case in a couple of slides. But there's additionally with that is that particle size is a true microbial biomass. There is no media added into this. Um, there's actually no chemical added either to develop these granules. 
It is a part of the normal everyday operation of the technology. Now, part of the reason that we actually um, we, we advertise this and we, we certainly see is that it's a more robust and resilient technology. And that's due to the granular shape and the fact that we have such a dense um, microbial population in those granules. So perhaps the most well-known of the attributes of AGS would be its superb settling properties. And we can quantify that by stating that in SVI-5 for AGS, is equivalent to an SVI 30 of conventional activated sludge. Or another metric we use is that an SVI 5 over 30 for the AGS is about 1.2. So we're seeing um, most of our settling occur within those five minutes with just a marginal improvement in those next 25 minutes. We also operate then at a much higher mixed liquor concentration compared to most conventional systems, about twice that at a standard design concentration of eight grams per liter. There are multiple facilities that operate at significantly higher concentrations, um, one in particular being the Carmovald plant in the Netherlands, which I believe sustains an operational MLSS concentration of 17 grams per liter. They've actually run a dual system with their um, existing um, AB process, and they divert over half of their flow to the significantly smaller and more energy efficient Narita process. And that really encouraged them with that higher mixed liquor concentration to be able to do that. And finally, inherent biological nutrient removal capabilities. So it has excellent BNR performance, and that's because of the structure and the size of the granule we're actually able to form and or develop the discrete aerobic and anoxic layers to get simultaneous nitrification and denitrification, where we can target effluent TN concentrations down to three milligrams per liter. Additionally, based on a very strong um, anaerobic feed phase, we also see um, incredible biological phosphorus removal um, consistently below one milligram per liter down to 0 0.5 milligrams per liter just with chemical as backup. So this is just a quick slide, really just to show a good visual of a comparison of the settling of AGS versus CATS. And you can see that these samples here were taken at different mixed liquors, uh, about twice as much for the AGS. And within this five minute settle time, you've seen that the AGS sample has completely dropped, whereas the CATS has just started to settle. And we can take this a step further when we move into just a, a nice video kind of displaying the two. And the samples we have here are actually from our um, treatment plant in Rockford, Illinois. And you can see we have a CAS sample and an AGS sample that were mixed up. And now we begin the settling and we're gonna turn that timer up on. So the AGS sample came from our demonstration facility at the Four Rivers Sewer Authority here in Rockford. And the conventional sample comes from their existing uh, flow through nitrification only plants. So you can see within just a matter of seconds really with the sample, we got the um, a majority of the settling to occur. And we have, of course uh, increased the speed here to get through the next half hour in order to assess the settleability of the conventional sludge. So around that 20 minute mark, most of the CAS had settled, but again, the AGS has been done for quite some time now. We have another little uh, kind of interactive video here, especially with the COVID restrictions last year, we were limited on the people, you know, coming out for seminars that we could bring down to our demonstration facility. But here we have our R&D engineer, Daryl. He grabbed a sludge sample during the react or aerate phase of the, uh, the cycle, treatment cycle. And he's gonna dump that sludge over a two millimeter sieve. So it's gonna really allow us to see how big these granules can get. She's showing you here, we've got ones that's about four or five millimeters here. And when you hold these or you touch them, they do actually have a bit of resistance to them. And it takes a little bit of pressure to actually um, pop or uh, squish one. So they're, they're kind of an interesting little material to hold. So now that you've kind of seen what the granular sludge looks like uh, in, in um, an actual plant, let's kind of take a step back and look at the more theoretical side of things. So what I have here are, two images. We have an image on the left-hand side of conventional activated sludge. And what we see here is a mixed microbial community due to the flocculent nature of the sludge. 
On the right hand side, you see a more idealized jawbreaker model to display the aerobic granular sludge. Now, if you notice, we have these same microorganisms are present. You have your PAOs, your nitrifiers, and your denitrifiers. So we have the same biology again, and it's subject to the same kinetics. You know, colder temperatures are going to slow down reaction rates. However, in the granular model, it's um, organized in a more efficient manner. We develop these layers. Now that's why that minimum diameter of 200 microns is so important. We need that diameter in order to develop a dissolved oxygen gradient. So our outer edges, we have the aerobic oxygen rich conditions that uh, allow the um, nitrifiers to uh, uh, fix here. And then as we go in deeper into the granule, we're gonna lose some of that oxygen. oxygen. It starts depleting and we're gonna be left with anoxic conditions that allow us to get the denitrifier populations to develop to perform the denitrification for complete total nitrogen. This uh, idealized model here also, I think does a good job of conveying why the granular biomass is more stable and less sensitive towards fluctuations um, in flows, or, or I should say loads or any toxic um, upsets that may occur to the system. And you can see it's the case because the contact area between the the bacteria and the bulk, limit, uh, bulk liquid is significantly smaller due to the granular structure. So the toxicity is really only going to mainly affect the outer bacteria. And we'll actually lead that into the next slide. So those idealized layers we saw on the last slide are of course not um, what we see in reality. The granules are not perfectly spherical and they don't have these um, completely discrete layers at all times. Instead you have voids and channels that go through the granule. And that actually allows the nutrients to penetrate in deeper and you get these pockets of additional microbial populations. So you have these nitrification or nitrifier pockets and that translates back to the, um, the robustness and resiliency to any toxic um, uh, or adverse process conditions that may occur. If you lose some of the bacteria on the outer edge of the granule, what you have is kind of like backup bacteria, if you will, in the inner portions of the granule that'll allow the process to more quickly recover from any um, upsets. The next slide here uh, is really uh, kind of a focus on the, um, the slower growing organisms in the, the system. So the PAOs and the GAOs. On this chart, we're showing the concentration of those in different samples. And if we look at the leftmost bar, we see a conventional activated sludge sample. And just to the right of that is what's called the total AGS sample. And then to the right of that, we took that AGS sample and we fractioned out um, the different particle sizes based on your uh, standard soil sieve set. But what we'll really focus on here, because we're really wanting to look at the entire mixed liquor, is just the AGS total against the conventional sample. And you can see that the AGS has a significantly more dense um, PAO population compared to the conventional sludge. And we'll learn why that's important as we go into the granulation aspect. So granulation. Granulation is the development of granules. Okay, so where do these granules come from? What are they developing from? Well, the aerobic granules are actually developed within the bioreactors just as part of the normal everyday operation, as I mentioned earlier. We don't add in a carrier, we don't add in any chemical to form these. They're actually formed from conventional activated sludge. So when we start up a plant, it's um, just fine for us to seed with the conventional sludge. You don't have to seed with granules. Seeding with granules um, would put you at your total design flow and um, treatment capacity and design objectives, particularly if you have really low nutrient limits as you are going to be limited initially by the quality of the seed sludge, the conventional activated sludge. If it's coming from a plant that is already look, uh, achieving um, low TP and low TM, a lot of those existing microorganisms organisms will already be present. But if it's a coming from just say a basic aeration basin, you're not going to have a lot of those more advanced uh, species developed as of yet. But what happens is over a month or so is we start getting these smaller granules to, to form just by running the system and by feeding it more substrate with the everyday influent that comes into the plant. And so we're excuse me, continually replenishing 
the granules within the process. And we waste similar to you as you would a uh, normal conventional process. And then just highlighting it's 100% true biomass. So again, it's developed within the Narita process so this is going to have a very strong volatile um, concentration in there. We're not looking at bulking it up with just inert solids. So how exactly are the granules formed? So there are two different selection mechanisms we look at. One being hydraulic selection, in which we're looking to retain fast settling particles. And the second is biological selection, in which case we're looking to um, really um, utilize the PAOs for the biopolymer that they produce. The hydraulic selection is uh, quite simple. It's really um, kind of just a densification uh, process. It's just one side of it. We're just selectively wasting the lighter, slower settling particles or the more flocculent sludge, and that allows us to wash those out. And that way we're retaining the denser, faster settling particles, and those will drop more quickly to the reactor floor. And this helps us get that big um, save in the decreased, or the big save on the settling time, allowing us to really um, drive that down and save a lot of time on the settling phase of operation. Now, hydraulic selection alone will not produce true AGS. To fully get the granules to form, and get the true, the nutrient removal capabilities and um, the extreme settling that you see with the larger granules, then you also need to apply a biological mechanism. And the biological mechanism is actually where we're gonna utilize the existing bacteria to draw out the extracellular polymeric substance. So that's why we are selecting for PAOs. And we're doing that um, because we want to get the EPS and the EPS, as I mentioned, is a biopolymer, and that's actually going to form the backbone of the granule upon which the microorganisms will populate. So in a way, the um, aquanarita technology is a, a bit of a cross between an activated sludge process and a biofilm process, because you do have this, this backbone, this biopolymer, upon which these microbial populations are affixing themselves. And you do get against with those, those dense populations as you saw on the, um, couple of slides that does actually aid a little bit in the settling as well. So how do we get the biological selection to occur? You saw with the hydraulic selection, we're just selectively wasting out during the settling period. But the biological selection uses a concept similar to enhanced biological phosphorus removal. We have strong um, and true anaerobic conditions. We have no oxygen and we've depleted most of the nitrates in the previous uh, settling phase. So there's also then a large supply of readily available carbon or substrate coming into the system with the fresh influent flow. So because of this, we are encouraging the phosphorus release and the VFA uptake with the PAOs in the system. So in this anaerobic uh, fill draw phase, you're gonna have the influent entering through an influent distribution grid that lays across the reactor floor. And as that water column rises through the reactor under uh, vertical plug flow conditions, you're providing contact of the substrate. Uh, you're giving it immediate contact into that settled sludge blanket. So those PAOs are exposed to a very concentrated carbon stream. So we get pretty high localized F to M ratios, which is how we're really accelerating the um, phosphorus release and also therefore secreting the EPS biopolymer that helps develop new granules. So this is all really great and exciting, but how do we actually see this happen in a full scale system? It's great if you can do it in a lab, but how do we get this happening for a plant that needs to treat millions of gallons per day? So we take the aerobic granular sludge and we're calling it the aqua Narita technology. So it is a system that consists of the ideal conditions for granulation. So we need a batch system. We're using timed uh, cycle, cycles, uh, such similar to um, you know, an SBR would. And then you also need both of the um, hydraulic and biological selection mechanisms. You're also looking at having continuous inflow. You always need some substrate coming into the system. That's not to mean that there is continually flow coming into one reactor. They do, as you saw, have um, the react and separate settle phases being a batch process, but rather that you are going to be feeding the system. 
And finally, it does apply a modular approach. As I mentioned earlier, we are, you know, with all of the unnecessary treatment conditions occurring within one reactor, it allows for the treatment of a variety of flows simply by increasing reactor size or using multiple reactors. That also makes um, phase expansions really simple as you simply increase the reactor quantity. So just for a quick overview on the technology, which I think I've hit on a lot of these points so far, it is a one tank reactor concept for your anaerobic, anoxic, and aerobic treatment, similar to a true SBR process. We get enhanced biological nutrient removal that includes the simultaneous nitrification, denitrification, simply due to the granule size and the DO gradient that forms within the granule. Then there's also the enhanced biological phosphorus removal which goes along with the granulation uh, biological, selection, biological selection mechanism for the granulation. Next, uh, the clarifiers. Again, a batch-based process. So we do the settling within our base, the, the reactors. So we don't need secondary clarifiers. And then primary clarification is going to be optional. Um, some facilities, uh, they wanna keep their primary clarifiers on site for um, methane production, for energy, um, other sites, particularly ones that may have very low TN and TP limits, they may want that extra carbon coming in with their feed in order to have enough substrate to drive the other necessary reactions. But that's something we look at by a, on a case by case basis um, and are of course flexible on that depending on the site's um, desires or needs. Um, and again, no sludge recirculation, batch based process. So similar to an SBR where we get the treatment we need there. So one thing that we avoid with that is the large internal recycles for the nutrient removal. And then again, time cycle flexibility. So operators have a lot of ability to, I, they don't manually have to adjust to the changing flows and loads. The system does respond to that um, uh, using a PLC based uh, controller, but it does allow for some uh, certainly flexibility in, in the field. So speaking of uh, flexibility in the field, so where does this system really fit in uh, in a treatment plant? So it is obviously, as you caught on by now, a biological secondary treatment process, meaning that upstream of it, we're going to have our headworks, which will consist of grit removal and screening. For the screening, we recommend six millimeter perforated plate screening with really the emphasis of removing um, wipes and rags that could potentially clog pumps or specifically the influent distribution grid. So that does mean though that the screening requirements are still significantly less stringent than say an MBR process would require. There's an influent buffer for plants that have one or two reactors only. Um, there is an influent buffer utilized to store flow during non-filling periods. But once you have three or more reactors, the buffer is not necessary. Again, unless it is um, good, better for the design or the plant wants it for storm flow, Again, that is uh, kind of a case-by-case -case basis that we discuss with engineers or, or sites, depending on, on their, um, their wants for their facility. And then the effluent that comes out of the bioreactors is the same as the effluent from any other secondary treatment process. You can send it down to tertiary filtration and any sort of disinfo disinfection process handles that fine. So one item that we do see that's a little different here is that you'll see that we don't have the WAS coming out of the reactors. Instead, we have that selective discharge. And we're wasting here that lighter flocculent material. So it's coming out at just a 0.1 or 0.3%. We don't wanna send all that water down to the solids handling processes because that could require them to be oversized. So we have a very small, what we call a sludge buffer. It's essentially a, just a side stream gravity thickener to help thicken that sludge up a bit. And the size of this um, basin is about maybe 5% of the reactor size. Um, it's, it's significantly smaller. So it does not have a, a major impact on footprint at all. And then it does thicken the sludge up to about 1%. And in that case, you can send it on down to any solids handling processes. We do often get questions on solids handling. So if there is time at the end, I'll go over a couple of slides on that. But in general, the AGS waste uh, performs similarly or better than um, activated or conventional activated sludge in any sort of digestion or dewatering process. So next up here is uh, the, the cycles, the process cycle. As I mentioned, we're a batch-based process and we uh, have different phases then within our cycles. 
The first is the fill draw phase, which I've mentioned before in order for those, that biological selection to occur. Then there's the react phase and then the settle phase. But really the best way to convey this is gonna be through with this animation. And you can see the fill draw phase begins and we have the influent flow um, being initiated and entering the bottom of the reactor in the influent distribution grid under vertical plug flow conditions. We don't have any air on at this point and the sludge bed is settled at the bottom of the floor. So we have stratified conditions in the reactor. So with this fill draw phase, again, we have the strong anaerobic conditions as the residual DO has been depleted um, due to microbial respiration and the denitrification of those leftover nitrates is done. And then we get the contact of the water column with the sludge bed to get the biomass conditioning. And while that wastewater is entering the bottom of the reactor, the clear supernatant is being displaced through uh, V-notch uh, v weirs at the top of the reactor. And then that effluent will head on down to any of the tertiary treatment processes or disinfection that the site may have. And then pay attention real quick here to the top of the, the water level there. You can see it drops a little bit there, about half a foot. And we wanna do that prior to the aeration system kicking on because we don't want those granules to get um, jump out and into the, the effluent weirs. So the react phase is going to be the longest phase. Uh, that's where we're getting the majority of our treatment to occur. And you can see we don't have mixers. We get enough uh, mixing energy just from the aeration system to homogeneously disperse the granules throughout the reactor. And here we have our aerobic conditions on the outside for nitrification. And that nitrate is uh, transported by diffusion between the outer aerated zones into the inner anoxic zones where we eliminate the need for the large internal recycles. We also are gonna have the luxury uptake of phosphorus that's promoted in this phase because we were depleted of phosphorus in the previous anaerobic fill draw phase. And then finally, the settle phase is initiated and you see the rapid settling of those dense granules occurs. And then we open a valve and you get the uh, selective wasting of that lighter flocculent sludge to occur. And as this completes, you're going to again uh, begin to initiate uh, a new uh, cycle as the uh, fresh influent will come into the reactor. So we'll jump now into a review of the uh, startup and the first year of operation of the Riviera Utilities Wastewater Treatment Plant at Wolf Creek. Uh, this is located in Foley, Alabama, so it's about a half hour north of the uh, uh, coast of, on the Gulf of Mexico. So just keep that in mind in terms of um, maybe effluent objectives is that there are, of course, a lot of issues with the Gulf of Mexico and eutrophication and nutrient loads. So this facility decided to upgrade to AGS after having utilized an extended aeration oxidation ditch process for the last 30 years. The move to the advanced treatment process, um, they needed to do something to expand capacity. So they increased from 2 MGD to 3 MGD at the average flow with our system being designed for a 6 MGD peak. And you can see it consists of three uh, circular reactors just under um, about 0.6 million gallons in volume. The facility was started up in January of 2020. So it's been operating for a year and a half now, just about. And it was seeded with conventional sludge from their existing extended aeration oxidation ditch process. Now, the reason why the plant looked into Aqua Narita was there were multiple decisions or criteria that went into this. The first, of course, being a capacity increase. The second was footprint limitations, which generally isn't something you think of in Alabama, but the site does actually have a, um, a limited amount of land that they currently own without the ability to expand due to some existing waterways. So they did have to consider that. Now they weren't quite as constrained as, you know, looking and eating an MBR process or um, uh, having to get that F level of effluent quality. So this really provided them the level of biological treatment they needed and a much smaller footprint. Had they decided to expand with their existing oxidation ditches, they would have been limited to a three and a half MGD average flow um, for the site's uh, existence. But with the Aqua Narita technology, they'll be able to expand up to about 10 MGD in the future should they ever need that level of capacity. The other main driver here was the need for future uh, biological nutrient removal limits. Both nitrogen and total phosphorus will be regulated in the future 
and that is anticipated due to their location with the Wolf Creek discharging eventually into Perdido Bay, which is a protected floor, uh, waterway. And then additionally, they were looking at reduced maintenance. They spent a lot of time with those oxidation dishes on mechanical um, maintenance. Um, they do get some upsets. And they also see obviously very large storm events um, from hurricanes and tropical storms in that area. And of course, energy, which translates to cost savings in the long run. This is just a, a quick visual here to display the footprint disparity of their existing um, or an extended uh, oxidation ditch process. That would have taken up or uh, does take up over two acres just to treat the 2MDD average flow. And then you can see the Akinorita system is outlined in blue, encompassing the blower building, um, the three reactors, and then we have a sludge buffer and a water level correction tank, um, in which uh, makes up the 0.65 acres here. So significantly smaller than the oxidation ditch process. Just quickly, a review of their uh, permits and design values. Design influent is fairly standard for a domestic application. As I mentioned, their current permits do not require TN or TP, but in the future, we're looking at a TN of five and a TP of 1.5. The TP is certainly um, very easy for the Narita system to reach. As I mentioned earlier, um, down to one to point, uh, five milligrams per liter is generally um, more of a standard uh, effluent quality out of the reactor. So when it came to startup, it occurred towards the end of January of 2020. And you can see that over time, we diverted flow from the oxidation ditches to the Narita process. And that uh, diversion lasted for about six weeks before they were able to completely shut down the oxidation ditches. And we did see just some general flow to plant has increased uh, through the year. So they actually are seeing kind of operating closer to their design flow these days. And we've also highlighted a few of the storm events that occurred during last year's um, hurricane season. I know one note from the operator or from the superintendent of the facility is he was thrilled because it was the first time um, with the utility that he was able to stay home uh, overnight during a, a storm event. He did not have to go into the plant. A lot of peace of mind was, was brought, which was really great to hear to know that this is also improving someone's uh, life outside of uh, the office. Next up is a focus on granulation. So this is the granule fraction. What we have here is a chart that shows the percentage of granules. So we take a mixed liquor sample and we look at how many of, how uh, much of that sample consists of particles that are 200 microns or greater. So we uh, look at startup, we see it with conventional activated sludge. So didn't have many particles in there. You will get some smaller particles to develop naturally in a CAS system. Um, and then we initially saw that the granulation was kind of started off really slowly, but when we uh, gave it a closer look at some of their other operating metrics, we noticed that their pH was a bit low, dipping below six. And just uh, for a general operation for any uh, treatment system, that was a bit low. So once we increased that up to about, about little close to seven upper sixes, granulation rapidly kicked off. You could see once we hit um, towards the end of March, that just um, immediately skyrocketed. And you can see we hit what we would call full granulation about um, by November of that year. Now you see full granulation is called out as being about 70 to 80% granules. You will never have 100% granules in a system because you're continually having new influent flow coming in, new sludge. And you're going to also continually be developing granules. Some of the bigger ones are going to fall apart and that new sludge is going to be turned into smaller particles and eventually full-size granules. Another item to uh, point out here is that you do not have to be fully granulated in order to meet your uh, treatment uh, uh, limits. So you can see that we were meeting permit here um, by February, um, again, just about a month or two after startup. Again, they did not have the nutrient removal objectives in place right now, but for their TSS, um, their BOD and ammonia, they're, uh, we're meeting that within uh, a month or so of the startup. And just a quick glance here at a couple of performance slides. You can see the BOD performance has been really strong. This is following tertiary filtration, but we do get um, 15, depending on how we, if we use baffles or not on the effluent weirs, you get 10 to 15 effluent BOD and TSS out of the Narita reactors. 
And then one other item to point out is I know we definitely have operators on the call today, but I have here the ammonia chart. So you can see ammonia after the first few weeks of operation settled in. It was pretty low for a good period of time. We did see in uh, about July or August of 2020 a little bump, but they also saw increased loads. So they had to make a little bit of adjustments, give a little more aeration time to handle that. And then once we jumped towards the December, we started noting that they were tra trending kind of high with the ammonia. So one of the greatest things about the Narita system is that it can actually be operated remotely. Um, and that is because of instrumentation. So you can, of course, get all the instrumentation in the world out there. You know, if you, you can have cameras set up, whatever you want, but that instrumentation needs to be, still needs some maintenance and cleaning. So one item that this plant has noticed is that their operations staff has noticed is that they're definitely not spending time on the mechanical maintenance like they used to with the oxidation ditches. However, they're learning that they're actually putting a little more focus on process. And even the superintendent himself has said that they are looking at graphs more often than they ever used to and they're starting to observe trends. So we use a DO uh, set point, and then also we can use an ammonia set point to drive operation and inform the system when it can reduce the aeration based on the demand. So once there was some cleaning done of the probes, it immediately dropped down to um, effluent ammonia well below one milligram per liter. Jumping back here, I guess the granulation is actually some pictures of those granules. And you can see just a month after startup, we started to get the little tiny 200 microns to develop, as well as a little bit larger 600 microns. And then if we jump ahead towards the end of the year, we've been running here for about, let's say eight and a half months. We have a very strong population of little tiny 200 micron granules. We're getting up to 1400 microns, and then you can see 2000 microns. So these granules about 10 times the uh, minimum size um, necessarily to be considered a um, aerobic granule, granule. I think the last item on uh, Wolf Creek is the energy consumption. As I mentioned, that was one of the um, criteria they were looking at when they were considering new treatment processes for their facility. And this graph here shows the specific energy consumption in blue. That's normalized as a kilowatt hour per cubic meter. And that's compared against the uh, average daily flow in red. So I mentioned earlier the Garmavolt plant in the Netherlands operates two processes, an AB process and an AGS process. Over the years, the operators have been incentivized to divert more flow to the AGS process by increasing the mixed liquor there to maintain an appropriate F to M ratio because they observe the energy efficiency. So as they are able to divert more flow, that the uh, specific energy consumption or that uh, continues to decrease. And what we see at Wolf Creek, you can see indicated on this graph here, we see about 0.28 kilowatt hours per cubic meter. And that's at the flow rate of three and a half MGD. And we can compare that to other uh, treatment processes. So we see that that's lower than even a trickling filter while still providing some level of nutrient removal and then significantly lower than the activated sludge processes. And of course, a membrane process or MBR, which is going to require significant, um, not just energy use through the years, but again, maintenance and then membrane replacement. So encompassing sort of all of the O&M there. So we'll jump here into, I think I've got about 10 minutes left here, just kind of quickly enhanced treatment. Um, it's kind of focusing on reuse applications and then um, a nutrient removal, low, kind of lower objectives. So with enhanced treatment, we look at why reuse. And there are of course a lot of different applications in terms of the uh, final effluent quality you actually need to achieve. Is it direct potable or are we just looking at title 22 kind of turbidity needs? Um, so we take that and you think, well, what can the Aquanarita process do with that? Well, the Narita is a proven solution for getting high quality secondary effluent, as well as seeing really strong biological nutrient removal without chemical. And then we need to consider, well, what kind of reuse are they looking for? What are their objectives? Um, of course, not all reuse um, applications have the same uh, limits that they're looking for. So we look at combining technologies to achieve different levels of reuse quality which leads us to a multiple, uh, a multi-barrier treatment process. Um, instead of using one single process, such as an MBR to get really high quality effluent, we'd be looking at following the biological system with cloth media filters, and then if necessary, um, ultrafiltration or membrane uh, system in order to meet really high quality. 
But frequently, um, what a lot of sites need is just maybe just Title 22. Um, they need a little bit finer BOD and solids removal out of the biological process, which can be met with uh, just filtration. So we're getting the turbidity down, meeting Title 22 needs. And the other really strong point with the, the filters is that you're getting uh, total phosphorus removal can be down to, I think we have a site out there, 0.043. Uh, that is, of course, with chemical addition, but it does allow you to get that those fine levels of effluent um, without the membranes, especially if you don't need non-detectable limits. So cloth medias are used for a lot of reuse applications. Um, they also allow for the increased phosphorus removal by removing more of the particle associated P. Um, of course, they operate under most uh, effluent and it's approved for Title 22 in California. Now, again, I keep going back, if you need really stringent effluent quality, the filters also are good pre-treatment uh, pre for the UF system because they allow you to downsize it because you're removing more of the solids. This is just a quick graph here showing the effluent total phosphorus that's aligned to our y-axis there against the influent total phosphorus. So these are actually based on, a, I believe, a pilot we had running down south. Uh, Alabama has very stringent phosphorus limits, um, but you can see that their target was 0.075. Now, a lot of things with phosphorus do depend on the, the speciation, but you can see this facility, when they were looking at a lower influent TP, under, let's say, around 0.7 being the cutoff, which is what the Aquanarita system can achieve biologically, with some uh, additional uh, chemical addition, um, they were able to, excuse me, um, I was off by a factor of 10 there, but you can see that um, you're going to further reduce the uh, effluent TP coming out of the filters um, if you have a really strong uh, bio P removal in the biological system. And then just for a few case studies, really just some more data kind of showing that that nutrient removal is um, just a quick overview of the demonstration facility that's at the Four River Sewer Authority here in Rockford. We take on a little more dilute uh, influent being in the Midwest. Um, we take, it's about a 200,000 gallon per day uh, system. It's the full scale depth that we would see for any other um, um, uh, design that we would do. 21 being our, our standard design depth, but increasing um, really the um, max depth being more limited by blowers and the minimum depth we can go down to about 15 feet. Um, that still gives us enough, um, enough depth to get the sludge blanket to settle. And so what we do at this facility is we execute R&D studies, um, such as uh, assessing um, high mixed liquor operation or looking at lower water level operation down to 15 feet. And we also bring operators to staff to train them as well, or uh, operation staff to the site to train them if they're gonna be starting up their own Narita system. Um, and that's in addition to startup training that we would be, be doing as well. Um, we did a couple of TN focused studies. Um, Six months in 2018, um, you can see that we are aligned here, the effluent TN on the uh, secondary y-axis. And you can see that we were generally below four milligrams per liter on the moving average. And this was while we were running other tests as well so that we weren't solely focused on the TN. And then same with the test the next year as we saw actually um, that effluent averaging below three and a half milligrams per liter. Um, one of the big R&D studies we have planned for the future is hopefully a year-long study really focusing on low TN and low TP. Here we have a case study that's relating more to the cost comparison of um, a few different um, technologies, specifically the AGS and MBR were the leaders here, but they were doing a comparison at three different treatment plants. You can see a variety of design flows and influent conditions, and also they were looking to meet different effluent objectives. But essentially, um, here we have, they call it granular activated sludge, but the uh, uh, AGS process was significantly less expensive than the other technologies that they were looking at. And I think this is the last case study here is in uh, Kingaroy, Queensland, Australia. It's a smaller facility at 2MDD, but they're looking for reuse applications here as well. And they actually reuse 85% of their influent flow for golf courses, the implant use and farming with the ultimate goal of being zero liquid discharge. So a lot of flexibility throughout the world and different objectives that the Narita systems are involved in. 
And we'll bring in the nutrient removal here is that 13 has consistently been uh, for their first few years of operation at three milligrams per liter uh, or lower um, with the TP just around one milligram per liter as well. And this site doesn't necessarily need very strong nutrient removal, but they've still been able to achieve that alongside their reuse objectives. Just a quick summary here. So aerobic granular sludge is, you know, very, um, a very, uh, as I said, well-established technology internationally, and it just improves upon conventional activated sludge treatment. And that we're using the same biology, we're subject to the same kinetics, but we're applying those selection mechanisms to get the granulation to occur. Now that's providing us the improved settleability and also the enhanced biological nutrient removal treatment as well. And that leads us to increased treatment capacity, a smaller footprint. And then we also have the uh, reduced energy demand because we're eliminating a lot of returns, we're eliminating mixers, and we'll also be reducing the maintenance needs as those mechanical items fall out of the scope as well. And with that, I think I'm just about on time uh, for a Q&A session. And of course, my email address is up there in case anyone thinks of something later that they'd like to ask about. Awesome, Paula. Well, thank you for a wonderful uh, information-filled presentation. Good. So uh, we do have a couple questions. And uh, okay. before we jump into that, a few more housekeeping items. Um, we are going to present a survey for folks to opt in to share your contact information with our presenter today. Um, so please take a minute to fill out the survey and let us know if you are OK with uh, PNC VUA sharing your contact information. Okay, so if, as that's wrapping up, uh, we'll jump into one of our first questions here. And um, that was regarding dewatering. And the question specifically was, how does aerobic granular sludge dewatering compare to conventional activated sludge? That is a great question. And I actually um, generally include a couple slides on that. And I um, had them saved and prepared right after the um, main presentation. Um, so I do have a little bit of uh, data on that is that yes, AGS produces more EPS um, compared to um, the conventional sludge, um, but it's, uh, it's a different kind of AGS. It's called an alginate-like alginate -like exopolysaccharide, and it forms more of a clump, if you can see in those images, compared to the slimy EPS that you see out of a conventional system. So that really doesn't negatively impact our solids handling. And we do have some numbers on digestion and dewaterability as well. So as I mentioned, aerobic, anaerobic digestion is pretty similar or better. And then dewatering, we see the same thing as well. You see uh, this dewatering study, study was actually done by Professor Kopp out of uh, Germany. Um, but you can see there's a reduction in the polymer demand and you get an increase in the dry solids. And of course, there's a comparison there of the AGS sample and the CAS sample, which pretty clearly uh, shows the, the, the difference in the structure of the, the EPS that, that forms from these uh, different technologies or um, processes. So everyone, if you wanna take a second to read that, the, um, the methane production does tend to be greater as well um, because we're uh, wasting the more flocculent, lighter sludge. There's a greater cellulose um, component there that uh, degrades more easily than the more concentrated sludge. Have you found uh, facilities have had to um, retrofit their existing dewatering equipment or they can use what's in-house to dewater despite the... Mm -hmm. Yeah, they can use their existing processes. Any sort of um, technology um, is suitable for uh, the AGS um, waste, um, if you will. Um, the only reason you would need to increase it is if you're, you need to upsize um, the you know, capacity at the plant in general. Um, the sludge yield is also quite similar to conventional activated sludge because, again, you're beholden to the same kinetics and, um, you know, dealing with the same biology. Okay. Um, kind of moving on to another question uh, about three quarters of the way through the presentation or so, you spoke a little bit about energy use and spoke to some energy savings with this technology, um, even compared to other treatment technologies like trickling filter filters. Where does that energy savings really come from? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, so some of it comes from the reduction in the mechanical equipment. As I mentioned, no mixers. Um, we don't have any of the uh, recycle uh, pumps going on. Um, another thing, especially when you compare it to, say, an MBR that's also operating in a very high mixed liquor, 
We maintain a very high aeration efficiency, similar to conventional activated sludge operating at say three grams per liter. And that is also due to the granular structure. So we're maintaining an alpha factor of I think 0.6 um, when we're even up at like 10 grams per liter. And you see a very minimal reduction in that efficiency as you continue to uh, increase the operational MLSS. Um, so those I would say are, the, are the, definitely the big culprits is the mechanical reduction there. And the fact that we're able to maintain a I'd say normal sized aeration system, despite um, increasing our, our sludge in there. And, and touching a little bit on the DO concentration, you're seeing the same DO requirements as a conventional activated sludge process, say about two mm -hmm. million or so. Yeah, your oxygen, you know, all the calculations in terms of your oxygen demand are, are the same. Uh, bless you, Casey. <laughs> um, so there, you're not having to upsize the aeration system for any, any other reason either. Okay. Um, circling back to dewatering, we had another question mm -hmm. come through um, regarding thickening. Uh, and the question is, can aerobic granular sludge be thickened prior to feeding to the digesters? And if so, how thick can be achieved? So what we do is we're wasting, um, calling back to I think that process flow diagram is that we are wasting out, um, at, like I mentioned like 0.3%, so very, very, very light. And we are sending them to actually a gravity thickener that is included as part of our, our treatment process. And we're thickening that up to about 1% prior to heading it down to, again, any solids handling that is occurring on site. So you could have additional thickening if you desire, um, but that's what we're, we're pushing out of the, the um, Aqua Narita system. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> and uh, a few minutes left here, so I'll kind of pose one additional question. Uh, you mentioned earlier in the presentation that uh, facilities that apply this technology no longer need um, secondary clarifiers. Mm -hmm. Have you seen uh, any examples where the plant has retrofit their secondary clarifier structures into sequence batch reactors to apply this technology? Yeah, we've definitely, we uh, do a lot of designs focused on retrofitting secondary clarifiers. There's one up in um, uh, Alberta that we're moving really forward, uh, really moving um, forward on with um, six retro, uh, six clarifiers will be retrofitting. Um, again, it's really a, a subject to the, the depth available, um, about 15, 14 to 15 feet understanding that the um, capacity increases that you get with the Narita technology and operating at the higher mixed liquor and the fast settling, you do lose some of that as you reduce the depth. You're gonna obviously get more bang for your buck at a deeper depth, but there's a lot of um, the retrofitting of clarifiers is perfect. Um, I did, you know, retrofits are actually a topic I would have bring, brought up as well. Um, as I mentioned, the Idaho Springs, um, they're retrofitting existing aeration basins. So, um, you can, if you have a basin on site, it can be retrofitted. Sure. Is there a change in slope or the geometry of the floor of, say, a secondary clarifier? Does That's that actually, sense? that is a good question. Um, you can have about a slight slope, maybe about one to three percent, um, but in general, you want to keep it pretty, uh, pretty level, and that's due to the plug flow conditions. We have that influent uh, distribution grid laying across the reactor floor, and we want to ensure that the um, water coming in right next to the influent valve isn't coming in too much more quickly than say the water at the other end of the reactor. We wanna make sure that it's um, kind of pretty pretty much level throughout there. And really to, to prevent breakthrough or short circuiting. Sure. Okay, well, we have about, there's two minutes uh, about left till the top of the hour here. Um, I'll just kind of give it 10 or 15 seconds. If anybody has additional questions, uh, please post them in the chat box. Any last minute ideas to um, share with Paula otherwise. Uh, we really appreciate the great presentation today and thank you to all attendees um, who were here. Again, PNCWA will follow up with um, the CEU documentation. Um, so please hang tight for that. That will show up via email. And an announcement that our next presentation is scheduled for Wednesday, June 9th. And the presenter will be Ingersoll Rand Water. Um, same time, 1 p.m. Pacific Standard Time to 2. All right, so it doesn't look like any additional questions came through. So uh, I think we'll close it at that. Paula, thank you so much for your time and thank you everyone for attending. Thanks everyone. Absolutely.